What I want to do now, and the last major thing I'm going to cover, is to um, turn to what I call going from lost victory, so it was um, in Kobe's term, uh, to Black April, the fall of South Vietnam. And what I want to look at is what was achieved very briefly between 1968 and 1972, and what we can learn from the Easter Offensive. And again, even among revisionists, there's no unanimity here. There, 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 there are some differences in views. Um, the Orthodox, however, say this. The reason for, uh, and so what is the reason for the 1972 Spring Offensive? And what that is, just to review, it was, and you can see it there, a three-pronged invasion, strictly conventional, no different than what happened in Korea, um, of northern troops hitting from north, the, the middle and the south, an attack on South Vietnam, strictly conventional with modern weapons, tanks, artillery, the whole bit. Um, uh, why did they do this? Um, the fulcrum for, um, for balancing the debate um, on what was achieved, anyhow, is the reason that they launched this offensive. The Orthodox give external reasons. They say um, North Viet because of the American Nixon's policy of detente, you know, with, you know, improving relations with Russia primarily, but also with China um, in 1972, they were worried um, that um, they might lose support as detente uh, developed. In other words, external. Um, they assumed the internal situation really hadn't improved in any significant way. Revisionists see significant improvement, but don't always agree on precisely how much. Echoing people like John Paul Van and Sir Robert Thompson, the British expert from that time, Lewis Sorley, William Colby, Rufus Phillips, and others see great and significant improvement in Vietnamization, turning over the war, pacification, um, rooting out um, the uh, Viet Cong infrastructure uh, in the countryside. Um, and um, there are others who can, who can talk, you know, Mark Morris certainly can talk more about this. Um, General Davidson um, is um, a little less, is, is somewhat less optimistic. And there are others um, who um, see it the same way. I think um, that the case for significant improvement, for dramatic improvement, is strengthened when you look at the North Vietnamese decision to launch the invasion of 1972. And again, this was a real change in strategy. And you don't change strategy unless your old strategy isn't working. And I want to cite um, several supporters of this. The first is Robert Thompson, who was the British expert who defeated the, um, uh, uh, the communists in, in Malaya way before Vietnam. And he said right after the invasion took place, um, this was a result of the success of Vietnamization and pacification that caused the North Vietnamese to invade. Uh, William Colby, uh, in his book, he writes about a trip he took with actually John Paul Van, and they drove across the whole Mekong Delta um, on motorcycles. They had somebody up, up, up above just to make sure. Um, but um, they said it was a different world. You could cross the whole Mekong Delta now and you could be safe and it was peaceful. And it was to get rid of that different world that the North Vietnamese launched their invasion. Third, and this is an Orthodox historian, his name is William Tur Tur Turley, but he's better than some of the others, I think. And he quotes Le Dato, who was the chief negotiator of Paris for years on, on the North Vietnamese side, in a memo right before, um, right, right before the invasion, saying that um, this was to defeat Vietnamization. Sorley quotes more from him and describing the situation in 1969 and 1970, and this is what Le Dato said. Our bases were weakened, our positions shrank, our main forces, get this, decimated. That's from an Orthodox. Well, that's, that's, from, that's from Lewis Sorrell. And fifth, um, somebody who stu stu studied this in great detail, um, Colonel Wilbanks, 
uh, and he um, informs us that um, in the debates in Hanoi, some people wanted to wait for us to leave. It would be, the Americans are going, why don't we just wait? Others were worried um, about Vietnamization, about the increasing strength of the Arvin, um, the South Vietnamese army, and the success of pacification. One of them was the boss by now, Lee Duan, Lee, Lee Duan and he argued that waiting, um, waiting, despite the fact the Americans were leaving, will make it more difficult to conquer South Vietnam. If the situation was dramatically better, um, in um, 1962, what can we learn from the Easter Offensive? And again, there is some disagreement um, even within the revisionist camp. First of all, the Orthodox, they write, um, you needed American support to defeat this invasion, which we did at just enormous cost to the North Vietnamese. Um, they had 100,000 casualties, the great bulk of their very modern force that they sent in. Um, but still, the orthodox argument goes, what this shows, if you needed American support, the situation was hopeless, it hadn't improved enough. That's that. Um, among um, the revisionists, you get um, these comments, and they vary one from another. Summers called it disastrous for North Vietnam, uh, as it was. But then he writes, and as he has with Tet, a tactical, tactical defeat uh, for them militarily, but a strategic success because it undermined American will. And we'll come to this again. Davidson sees pluses and minuses. But he writes this was a, um, a very severe test that they passed, although he said uh, the real test would come later. Uh, Dale Andrade writes this, and it kind of brings things together. He said, yes, the Arvin needed American firepower. There's no question about that. Um, Colby and Sorley are the most positive. Both use a variation of the phrase, the war is won. Um, what they mean by that, and I'm going to now be talking about Sorley, what they mean by that is that with the proper American support, the war was won. The South Vietnamese could have held out. And what he does to strengthen this argument, and I think it's pretty compelling, he says, look at the other two countries that were divided by the Cold War, West Germany and South Korea. And our support for them never ended. In fact, we kept 300,000 troops in West Germany, because West Germany couldn't defend itself. And, and uh, we kept about 50,000 troops in South Korea, then, then gradually somewhat less. We didn't end our support for them, even with American troops. What are we expecting South Vietnam to carry on without American support? And he's very scathing about this. Of course, as everybody in this room knows, um, that support was not forthcoming. Um, not just in terms of American forces leaving, but because American aid decreased. And that brings me to the last major issue I'm going to talk about, which is the causes or blame for Black April, what happened in 1975. And if you look at the two maps, uh, Basic, the strategy is basically the same, except um, in 75 they succeeded. What do the Orthodox say about the reason? They don't deny that to uh, some extent, um, the, um, uh, to, phrase, to paraphrase uh, Colonel Wilbanks's book, that we abandoned Vietnam. To some extent we did. Even Orthodox historians will accept that, some of them. Um, but the main problem, they say, was that, the South, that South Vietnam was hopeless. If it, problems hadn't been fixed, it was still not viable. Revisionists, um, for the most part, reject this. And those who uh, assign more blame to the South Vietnamese generally say this is because um, of things we had done before or failed to do before. In other words, by 1975, our failures up till then made the situation un un untenable. What I want to do is just focus on one thing. On, on one thing. I want to focus on the question of aid and what happened and the relative aid 
given by the United States and uh, the Chinese and the Soviet Union, but especially the Soviet Union. Um, Orthodox historians one, um, will, will say this. One of them says, both sides were famished because aid decreased. Um, another, and this is Turley actually, he's saying while the, you can't fully compare the money numbers and value, there's no doubt, as he puts it, about American generosity um, as compared to the Soviet Union and China. Um, I think there are enormous problems with this, and what I want to do is, again, just focus on the question of aid um, and the numbers, because um, it's not just a matter of how much you gave, it's a matter of need. What did each side need after 1973? Soviet aid did decrease in 1973 and into 74, when at the end of the year it spiked. Well. There's good reason for that. South, North Vietnam needed much less aid. The Americans were no longer in the war. There was no air war to be fought. And fully a third of all the aid North Vietnam got from the Soviet Union was the sophisticated equipment to um, maintain their air defenses. Once, and it's more than a third if you count all the ammunition, um, the air defense ammunition. Once the North Vietnamese didn't have to fight that, they didn't need all that aid, and what they were able to do in 1975 is send a lot of these anti-aircraft stuff down south where they took a heavy toll on the South Vietnamese Air Force. So they needed much less. The person who does the most thorough job of this was um, gentleman Colonel William Legros, who wrote a book uh, called um, Vietnam from um, ceasefire to capitulation. And he points out something else in terms of needs. North Vietnam, he said, was on the offensive. It could um, accomplish its objectives with much less ammunition and equipment than the South because it could focus, it could concentrate on selecting targets. The South Vietnamese, and you can look at the border, had to protect a huge area now without the Americans populated areas, bridges, roads, and this 800-mile flank uh, exposed um, uh, to the North Vietnamese, the, um, uh, its western border there, an 800-mile flank, which was, it had you know, a lot of mountains and very heavy vegetation, meaning that the South Vietnamese um, further that, the Ho Chi Minh Trail gave the North Vietnamese interior lines. The South Vietnamese had to move their troops very quickly, unlike the North, and for that they required expensive equipment that was very difficult to maintain, helicopters, planes, and the rest. That's why George Veith, who wrote the book Black April, that covers this in great detail, <clears throat> writes, I think, trying to be polite, that um, making money comparisons between the aid we gave and the aid the Soviet gave, and everybody knows we've decreased our aid and inflation ate away at a lot of it. To make money comparisons, as he put it, is disingenuous. Go beyond that. After 1973, um, we no longer could have advisors to the South Vietnamese Army. But before the 1975 offensive, um, North Vietnam's leading generals went to, went to the Soviet Union, where they studied how to combine and work together with um, infantry, armor, and artillery, uh, a flaw that they had um, demonstrated in the 1972 offensive. The American aid cut further was based on a ceasefire that never materialized, I think, as everybody knows. Uh, instead, we had what one French expert called the most murderous truce, continuing fighting. And the result of the cuts, as General Davidson put it, was devastating. That the Arvan collapsed in 1975 is hardly a surprise against this background. Um, um, George Wheat's book, which really deserves reading, is interesting because he argues that um, the South Vietnamese did a lot better than they're usually given credit for, even by revisionists. And his book, therefore, makes very interesting reading, certainly good to me. I have one more point. And that I'm done. Um, you've heard this already from, from, um, from Bob Tucker. 
Um, the regime that took over uh, Vietnam in 1960, 1975, and especially when you look at Cambodia and everything else, and what it did and what it was like, its inefficiencies, its brutalities, and all the rest, is um, often used by revisionists as it should be. Uh, in the debates to discredit the orthodox case. I want to go a little bit further, though, to what I consider the heart of the orthodox case. Um, and that is, again, that North Vietnam had legitimacy because of Ho and the stuff I talked about before. And that South Vietnam, and now I'm quoting these folks, or one of them in particular wrote a textbook on it, was a pseudo nation. A counterfeit creation. Is this true? Well, all these years later, if you look at a map today, you're going to find a lot of countries like South Vietnam. You're going to find countries with bigger problems in South Vietnam. Uh, what are they doing there if South Vietnam was not viable, uh, was an American creation? What about communism? Well, back in 1975, um, uh, communist countries, and I mean countries with communist systems, economic systems, uh, governed or ruled about a third of the world's population. What do they rule today? Real communist systems. You've got two countries left. You've got Cuba, and you have the dystopian North Vietnam, excuse me, North, North Korea. Um, not the rest. Where's the Soviet Union? It's defunct. It is, uh, as one of its two founders, Leon Trotsky, put it in denouncing others, it has been consigned to the dustbin of history. Uh, communist China is on the map. They call it the People's Republic of China. But there's no socialism there anymore. There's no communism there. They have what we would call, I think, state capitalism. I, I teach a lot of students from China, and a lot of them in America these days. And when you talk about socialism in China, they just kind of smile. They know they're not supposed to say anything, but no one takes it. These are very wealthy kids, you know. <laughs> and by the way, they all speak perfect, unaccented, colloquial English. They've spent large parts of their lives outside of China. It's, it's really interesting. Um, they call it the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. But as we know, they, at about the time they jumped social, socialism in China, or communism in China in the 1980s, they did the same in Vietnam. You don't have it anymore. It's gone. They can call themselves that. But there is no communism there. Swept away in Eastern Europe. In Laos, they say they're socialists, but they're not. Cambodia is a monarchy again. What happened? Well, it turns out, I think at least, that it was communism that was not viable. It collapsed on its own because it could not provide for its citizens uh, a sufficient way of life, an acceptable way of life, at least when compared to capitalism. And people in these countries found out about this. How this um, is relevant to the orthodox and revisionist debate um, I can't necessarily say, but I can say this. If Ho Chi Minh and his comrades won the battle for Vietnam, they lost the battle to establish communism there. And that, at least for me, is one of the primary reasons to re-examine the Vietnam War. Thank you very much. <laughs>